morning. It's a pleasure to be here this morning. I can ask your indulgence on two things. It's allergy season, so I have a real hard time during this time of the year speaking. And two, uh, most of the speaking I do when I walk up to the podium is very technical. It deals with cybercrime and identity theft, forgery, embezzlements, and things of that nature. I don't often talk about my life, but Google has asked me today to do something that different and talk a little bit about my life. So I will do that. And then at the end, of course, I'll take questions. And those questions can be about any subject matter that you uh, like to ask. As you know, I've had a lot of people tell my uh, story. I had a great movie director write a, a film about my life. I had a great uh, Broadway musical team make a Tony Award winning Broadway musical about my life. I had a popular television show on TV, White Collar, for four years, created around my life. Uh, most of those very creative people have actually never met me personally. <laughs> <laughs> but they've enjoyed telling my story from their point of view. So I thought I would take a few minutes this morning and actually tell you the story from uh, my point of view. Uh, I was raised just north of New York City in Westchester County, New York. I was actually one of four children in the family, the so-called middle child of the four. I was educated there by the Christian Brothers of Ireland in a private Catholic school called Iona, where I went to school from kindergarten to high school. By the time I had reached the age of 16 in the 10th grade, my parents, after 22 years of marriage, one day decided to get a divorce. Unlike most divorces where the children were usually the first to know, my parents were very good about keeping that a secret. I remember being in the 10th grade when the father walked in the classroom one afternoon and asked the brother to excuse me from class. When I came out in the hallway, the father handed me my books and told me that one of the brothers would drive me to the county seat in White Plains, New York, where I would meet my parents, and they would explain what was going on. I remember the brother dropped me at the steps of a big stone building and told me to go on up the steps, and my parents would be waiting for me in the lobby. I remember climbing the steps, seeing a sign on the building that said family court, but I really didn't understand what that meant. When I arrived in the lobby, my parents were not there, but I was ushered into the back of an immense courtroom where my parents were standing before a judge. I couldn't hear what the judge was saying, nor my parents' response. But eventually, the judge saw me at the back of the room and motioned me to approach the bench. So I walked up to stand in between my parents. I remember distinctly that the judge never looked at me. He never acknowledged I was standing there. He simply read from his papers and said that my parents were getting a divorce. And because I was 16 years of age, I would need to tell the court which parent I chose to live with. I started to cry, so I turned and ran out of the courtroom. Judge called for a 10-minute recess, but by the time my parents got outside, I was gone. My mother never saw me again for about seven years until I was a young adult. Contrary to the movie, my father never saw me or ever spoke to me again. Every Monday morning when I come to work, I have emails. They come from all over the world. Someone who's seeing the movie for the first time, watching the play at a community theater or a high school somewhere, and they feel compelled to write. And of course, they come from people literally as young as eight years old sending those emails to people as old as 80. Most people assume I'll never read those emails or see those emails, but they feel compelled to write and they want to make a statement. Some say, you know, you were brilliant. You were an absolute genius. I was neither. I was just a child. Had it been brilliant, had it been a genius, I don't know that I would have found it necessary to break the law in order to just simply survive. And while I know that people are fascinated by what I did some 50 years ago as a teenage boy, I've always looked upon what I did as something that was immoral, illegal, unethical, and a burden I live with literally every single day of my life and will until my death. There are many who write and say, well, you know, you were certainly gifted. That I was. I was one of those few children that got to grow up in the world with a daddy. Now, the world is... The world is full of fathers, but there are very few men worthy of being called daddy by their child. I had a daddy, loved his children more than he loved life itself. Steven Spielberg told Barbara Walters, the more I researched Frank's youth, now without having met Frank, I couldn't help but put his father in the film through the likes of Christopher Walken. My father was a man who had four children, three boys and a daughter. Every night at bedtime, he'd walk into your room. He was 6'3". He would drop down on one knee, kiss you on the cheek, pull the cover up, and he'd put his lip up on your earlobe, and he'd whisper deep into your ear, I love you. I love you very much. He never, ever missed a night. As I grew older, I sometimes fell asleep before he got home, but I always woke up the next morning 
knew he had been at my bedside. Years later, my older brother joined me in my room temporarily. He was in the Marine Corps. He was 6'4". He played semi-pro football for Buffalo. But my father would walk around to his bed, hug him, kiss him, whisper in his ear. He loved him. When I was 16 years old, I was just a child. All 16-year-olds are just children. Much as we'd like them to be adults, they're just children. And like all children, they need their mother and they need their father. All children need their mother and their father. All children are entitled to their mother and their father. And though it is not popular to say so, divorce is a very devastating thing for a child to deal with and then have to deal with the rest of their natural life. For me, a complete stranger, a judge, told me I had to choose one parent over the other. That was a choice a 16-year-old boy could not make. So I ran. How could I tell you my life was glamorous? I cried myself to sleep till I was 19 years old. I spent every birthday, Christmas, Mother's Day, Father's Day in a hotel room somewhere in the world where people didn't speak my language. The only people that associated with me were people who believed me to be their peer, 10 years older than I actually was. I never got to go to a senior prom, high school football game, share a relationship with someone my own age. I always knew I'd get caught. Only a fool would think otherwise. The law sometimes sleeps, but the law never dies. I was caught. I went to some very bad places. My boys have grown up asking their mother, why is it that dad gets up in the middle of the night and goes down to the TV room? Because you know he doesn't turn the TV on. He just sits there all night. That's because there are things you can't forget, things you're not meant to forget. While I was sitting in that pitch black cell in France, my father, 57, was climbing the subway stairs in New York as he did every day. He was in great physical shape. He just happened to trip. He reached his arm to break his fall. He slipped, hit his head on a railing, landed at the bottom of the step. He was dead. I didn't know he was dead. I was thinking about him, how much I couldn't wait to see him, hold him, hug him, kiss him, tell him how sorry I was. But I never got the opportunity to do that. I was very fortunate because I was raised in a great country where everyone gets a second chance. I owe my country 800 times more than I can ever repay it over these past four decades. That is why I'm at the FBI today, 32 years after the federal court order expired requiring me to do so. I have turned down three pardons from three sitting presidents of the United States because I do not believe, nor will I ever believe, that a piece of paper will excuse my actions, that only in the end my actions will. Forty plus years ago on an undercover assignment in Houston, Texas, I met my wife. When the assignment was over, I broke protocol to tell her who I really was. I didn't have a dime to my name, but I eventually asked her to marry me against the wishes of her parents. She did. Now, I could sit up here and tell you that I was born again, I, I saw the light, prison rehabilitated me. But the truth is, God gave me a wife, she gave me three beautiful children, she gave me a family, and she changed my life. She and she alone. Everything I have, everything I've achieved, who I am today, is because of the love of a woman. And the respect three boys have for their father, something I would never, ever jeopardize. There comes a time in all of our lifetime, we grow older, and eventually, if we're fortunate enough, we have children. And as every parent knows, whether your child's three months old or 38 years old, when you lay your head on a pillow at night, and you're just about to close your eyes, the last thing you think about, the last thing you worry about, are your children. So if you still have your mother, you still have your father, you give them a hug, you give them a kiss, you tell them you love them while you can. And to those men in the audience, both young and old, I would remind you what it truly is to actually be a man. It has absolutely nothing to do with money, achievements, skills, accomplishments, degrees, professions, positions. A real man loves his wife. A real man is faithful to his wife. And a real man next to God and his country put his wife and his children as the most important thing in his life. Steven Spielberg made a wonderful film, but I've done nothing greater, nothing more rewarding, nothing more worthwhile, nothing that's actually brought me more peace, more joy, more happiness, more content in my life 
than simply being a good husband, a good father, and what I strive to be every day of my life, a great daddy. God bless you, and thanks for coming this morning. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.